All right. Welcome to your Wednesday night vibe tribe. You know, I bet other people have called their audience the vibe tribe, but this is the real one. This is the real one. Stoked to have everybody here. See a lot of awesome legends in the chat, particularly like this screen name. Rogan is shorty pie. Very awesome. And I think I see slick dissonance sliding in fashionably on time. Very cool. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Big haircut. Oh man. So, uh, we got the great uncle Mike here, Mike Juan, the uh, Algonquin legend, the Susquehanna sage himself. Super excited to just hang and chat with Mike tonight where we go, who knows, but you know, there's at least a little bit on the table to talk about some of the synchronicities around this recent eclipse cycle. There's nobody in the world that I think has a better nose for sorting these things out than you. So how you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, it's good to see both you guys. It's good to be back. Um, life's weird, dude. Life has gotten so weird. Uh, and I'm excited to kind of play around with the weirdness uh, of all the things which, which, you know, what I'm experiencing um, individually, but then more so like the collective weirdness, which we're all kind of sharing. It's super weird. I wouldn't have it any other way. Gabe, how you doing tonight? Big haircut. Thank you. Yes, I'm doing wonderful. How do I sound? Am I coming through all right? Usual lag? A little, yeah, there's that little delay. We work with that with Gabe here. So we just give him space to respond and we take our time. And, you know, we don't have to have be that rapid fire, zero dead air radio professional thing people they're here for the vibe and if a little bit of silence is part of that that's all good so welcome man is it a haircut or just uh your hair's up and you shave the beard trim like you don't have the wolverine sideburns anymore <laughs> yes you know mike Juan. as soon as i shave down to this, you were the first face I thought of when I looked in the mirror with this new look. <laughs> I thought of you, Mike. I said, wow. It's very synchronous that uh, it was a couple days later we're on the show. Well, I'm glad that we've got the name tags on the video because now that we look so much alike, people would be confused which one of us is who. So so I'm glad, Chad, that we've got the we've got the names on. Uh, on here. So, dude, I, I've been wanting to talk to you since I had a dream about you going all the way back to the night of the bridge collapse. So okay. I told you that about this dream in a text message, but that night, cause it happened overnight. So maybe my dream was occurring at the same time as the bridge collapsing could be. Uh, so in this dream, you and me and a group of other, you know, extras, you know how dreams have extras. <laughs> we were playing, flag, we we're playing flag football in a, an NFL stadium, but the NFL stadium was shaped or the, uh, the field was shaped like a crescent. And those are the pertinent details that I managed to, you know, claim from the dream and hold on to. And so there were some symbols in there that I just found fascinating to line up with that bridge collapse. Cause when I think of Mike Juan, I think of he's the Susquehanna guy can't separate the okay. two ideas, right? <laughs> All right. So you have Susquehanna, you have football, but it's kind of fake football. It's false flag football. <laughs> okay. 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 And then you have the, uh, the shape of the, if the shape of the field being a crescent is very strange. I personally like that association going with the boat because, uh, in the mystery tradition, when you see a crescent moon, it doesn't always necessarily mean the moon. It actually can also mean the arc, like with the uh, the flood, destruction, and regeneration of the world, rebirth mythos. But it, and it can also mean the moon, of course. So with the crescent, that's something the eclipse does. It creates that crescent shape in the sky. But then also there's a boat hitting a bridge. So there's like all these components of uh, that dream that make it feel very premonitory. And I thought, we got to talk to Michael. And then with some of the things that you've been saying on like Instagram and your YouTube channel about the, uh, the current ast astrology, weather, I knew we had to get you on here and see what you thought about, uh, all of the above. 
All right. Well, so we want to just jump right in and, and talk about the eclipse because there's there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Sure. Unless you're holding we'll, back we'll something that you're we'll wanting to say. Your, we'll, weave it in, we'll weave it into the dream. Um, uh, I My dreams, I have a lot of dreams which are like a uh, sports uh, setting. Like in my dreams, I'm a, there's a lot, there's always games happening. So I, I find it interesting that that I showed up in your dream in in a similar type of setting, which which my dreams were. Because I don't uh, have a lot of sports dreams. I can't think of any besides that one. Yeah, yeah, I probably have one a week of like some different sort of like sporting game type of activity. So, uh, but I want to go. Let's let's just lean right into this with 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 the bridge. Um, first, we want to link the bridge to the solar eclipse because its occurrence um was on uh was on the 26th i think it was a calendar date 26th but time like you know measured time from the precise moment of the lunar eclipse that occurred on march 25th it was like less than 20 it was still within the same day cycle um and so because of that, like it, it seems to me to be very linked to the eclipse, to the solar eclipse, because eclipses always come in pairs. Um, there's a solar eclipse and a, and a lunar eclipse that occur usually within like 14 days of each other. Um, so so that right away kind of like jumped in my head. And so we'll we'll switch to the the solar eclipse. Um, everyone's talking about the clip, the eclipse portion, which, you know, whatever an eclipse is like, yeah, that's, that's a real thing. And it's, it's, it's worthy of, of being aware. And, but they happen like, you know, once every 170 days or so they happen somewhere on earth, you're going to see like a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. So you look at like the details of any given eclipse to really get like the flavor the texture, what makes it special. And there were two things that made this eclipse, at least in my opinion, really special. And it was the fact that where the moon and the sun were going to be. So solar eclipses happen on a new moon. So that means that they're, the sun and the moon are conjunct in the same spot. That location is exactly the same location where Chiron is. And so to have an eclipse which is conjunct another planet, particularly one which um, like Chiron as an archetype ties into eclipse lore, if you will, that like really dovetails, you know, outside of the, the happenings and culture. But so you got that. And then you got this comet. You got this comet, which not only is, is visible in the sky, but it's visible in the sky at the same part of the sky, like, like 15 degrees an arc away from where the eclipse is happening. And so traditionally, we always have been told like comets are bad omens and eclipses are bad omens. And now we've got a comet and eclipse and they're visible. And we're calling it the devil eclipse, the devil comet. Like all this sort of like this craziness is happening. But the real name of the eclipse or of the of the comet is called um, Pons Brooks. And so now we go and we look like like we'll, we'll start with Chiron, like Chiron astronomically and astrologically is symbolized as the key like that's a symbol of chiron it's a freaking key and in the in latin like pons means bridge so it literally says key bridge it says key bridge is happening you're like whoa what what the key bridge you hit by the eclipse and then you're like well what hit it oh salvador dali what the guy who's like surreal and if he was going to be communicating from some other like realm like this is how he would do it like yeah this is exactly how it's unfolding and it's like you know uh level up welcome to the game like that's just the backdrop that's the backdrop okay, the when you say backdrop. salvador dolly hit it, it i i you know maybe didn't hear all of the full details of the reports about that event you know i just get the trickle through the grapevine so what do you mean by dolly hit it the name of the boat is called the dolly okay <laughs> Okay. It's literally named. And so there, there's like a famous Salvador Dali painting. I mean, he was a very prolific painter. And so he, 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 he painted a lot. Um, he's best known for like those melted melting clocks images, but he also painted something which is called, I think the bridge of dreams. And it shows this bridge, which is like half complete. 
And after about a week or so of the cleanup process, uh, like there were all these images taken of Baltimore, of the bridge, and it looks it looks eerily similar. Like, I mean, it's it's the, in the same way that that the Hilton, the Hilton Millennium Hotel was an exact match to um, to the 2001 monol space odyssey monolith and you're just like how do you how do you explain this like this is in my opinion on that level of um of just like however you want to define it i'm not gonna each person has to go and make sense of this according to their own understanding of reality but but this is this is this is part of the narrative which has unfolded and this is just scratching the surface. Like, I mean, I got deep into this and it just gets weirder and weirder. I'm ready. I'm ready. I mean, my, my first thought was to start thinking about what happens when that, when that comet comes around, is that uh that's obviously something you've dug into. I would think uh, historical recurrences of that comet. I mean, uh, Oh, okay. Okay. So, all right. So that's, we can we can we can go there. So this is where it gets real interesting. Do I have screen share? Yeah, you can do screen share. How do should I do the, screen share on this? Should be a little menu at the bottom. And I see give mute you, settings. Present. Oh, present is probably screen share, right? Yes, sir. All right. Let me see if uh, share screen. So share screen. I don't know how this. All right, so I'm just going to talk it through. So um, I had scheduled an event, um, like pivot on the story. Like, you know, Mike's like, what does Mike do with his time? Like what I'm doing with my time right now is I'm investing in, uh, and maybe we'll talk about this in greater detail later, these like arrow circulation practices, like literally like circulating arrows um, uh, in the ancient practice across the land. And what that means in, in like a little bit more finer detail is it's being done by these river and star ceremonies that are being held in certain locations, which is a combination of natural astrology and weaving water from the Susquehanna river into other rivers. So like, it's a circle, it's a cycle. That's why it's a circulation, like going across the country. So it was kicked off this year. Like when, like, you know, there's a decent amount of planning that goes into this. And so it was decided to be kicked off at the eclipse. This is in January. Like I knew the eclipse, I always know there's an eclipse coming and I knew that this eclipse was kind of significant, but I had no idea it was going to become like the, the sort of like Super Bowl halftime show, which it seemingly became for like two weeks. But anyway, so I decided to go and, and we're going to kick it off at the key confluence from the Susquehanna river. Um, which is a town called Sunbury and the name Sunbury means eclipse, right? Like when's the sun buried during an eclipse, like a little bit of wordplay with that. And I was there at Sunbury, Pennsylvania at the 2017 eclipse. And it just kind of made sense. So like that was like all done, like before I knew about any comets before like any bridges collapses, like that was just like kind of the play. Like it's going to be an eclipse. It's like, so that, that goes on. One of the things that makes Sunbury uh, Pennsylvania, that's where, that's where Sunbury is, where the primary confluence is of the Susquehanna River. Sunbury is known historically for where Thomas Edison built his first three-wired distribution of electricity. So there had been other distributions of electricity and they were working it out and they're like, oh, we need to have like a ground and a positive and a negative and we're gonna distribute it. So the first time that, the same sort of model which we use currently was put into place was at Sunbury. And Sunbury, like, you know, that's their claim to fame. Like it's the first place, uh, Edison's electrification project. So there's that. And so when I first started learning about the comet, like all sorts of things were coming in. There's so many ways you can go about this comet. It's, it's fascinating. But um, I first went to it, like kind of just like general comets. Like a comet is uh, in electric universe, um, in electric universe uh, theory, like the comet is the negative charged ion that shoots through the, the outer space and like it's sending the signal, if you will. 
And if you then go and apply that to like as above, so below microcosm, and you're like, okay, the brain, the brain is like electrical as well. And like it's electrical signals. Um, there's a part of the brain, which is like a key distributor of the brain. And that part of the brain is called pons. The same thing that pons means bridge, the same pons in the comet. I'm like, all right, we got this electrical universe thing, and we got we got where the, the original place of the of, of the electrical signal uh, uh, distribution and like the the confluence on the oldest river on the planet, like it mirrors three wires. Like Edison was a big like theosophist and spiritualist, so he thought this way. So I'm like, oh, this is going on, and then and then my brother. Like probably like the day before, the day before like the 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 event, like I I asked myself the same sort of question that you just posed. You're like, well, when else did this comet show itself in history? And so I start looking. And so the comet, the comet was visible in the same year. So it's got a it, the comet has almost a 72 year orbit, which puts it on a processional uh, processional time frame, like. Uh, the precession of the equinox is one degree every 72 years approximately. So it's like two clicks, click, click, like it's perfectly timed. And it was visible at the same year, at the same time when, when Edison turned on like, you know, this three wild distribution. So I'm like, we are on the same sort of like frequency time wave as that. And then I looked a little bit even deeper and on the exact same date that they did that, there was a, um, a, a so I'm reading about like the electrical thing. It's like on this particular date, they in September 22nd, 1883, they did they what they did was they electrified their first church. And then you go and you look at like astronomy history on ponds, and it says on September 22nd, 1883 was the day that the comet changed forms and took like it was a major change in its its, its expression in the sky. And so I'm like, this thing is like somehow so friggin' tied up like timeline in comet time, you know, there's, there's something, there's something there, which we're working with. You know what I noticed? So, okay. It was 1883. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 1883, 1884. So okay. the comet's visible in the sky for like, I don't know, like let's say 200 days. Well, you brought up surrealism and Dali. I'm going to have to do this for Gabe because he's not here, but this is like, this is a thing that he, he circles back around to all the time, but you know, the painting, the scream, I'm going to bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh one of the most iconic freaky paintings of all time. So the scream is supposed to be related to the Krakatoa eruption. And that happened at this exact same time frame. 1883, 1883 exactly. like August, 1883. So that's well, some we weird juju for sure. The previous, uh, it's discovery, like according to, you know, whoever writes the history and tells us the way the world works. So according to those folks, um, it was first discovered by Pons in 18, um, 1812, it, but it corresponded with like the whole 1811 comet, which is corresponded with the whole like uh, New Madrid earthquakes. So, so there's, I mean, that seems to support what you're going with, like the volcanic explosion. Like there's seemingly some pretty big things happening on the surface of earth when, when, um, when uh, this comet has gone by in the past, it also went by in 1954. Uh, I, don't know of anything quite to the same level that happened at that year. So I, it doesn't seem to be consistent, but we did have that 4.7 in New, in New Jersey. Yeah. It's like the whole old idea of comets being harbingers of, of doom. <laughs> well, maybe there is something that gets uh, aggravated and what looks like doom to us is really just bringing about some big change. I think it's particularly potent that, so one thing about solar eclipses is that they occur where the North node is at in the sky. Mm -hmm. So if we were talking tropically, the North nodes in Aries and like, I personally had some big stuff happen in my life, right? When that node shift ha uh, occurred and because I shouldn't say because, but parallel to that, the Chiron being in the sign of Aries, it's like when the North node got in there at the same time, <laughs> the, uh, it's time for some 
is going to hurt a little bit, but there's like some healing that has to happen. And that's necessary to move forward in your like life mission, your spiritual purpose, Certainly, you know, so Certainly. that all this is happening with Chiron in there and that Aries is the start of the whole Zodiac. I find that particularly interesting that maybe more than the average eclipse cycle, there could be a new world thing happening right now, or like a, I don't want to say like a new age, but a, a very key moment in time delineating from something before and what comes next, at least for me personally. But I, I don't think there's the separate, I don't think there's a difference between for right. me personally or for you personally and the entire world. I mean, I, I think it, it goes without saying comet or no comet. Like we're in the major, we're in the midst of a major transition. It's a transition we've been part of our entire lives. Like we've been born into this transition that, uh, I mean, I'm going to couch the transition right now being like a technologically driven te uh, uh, um, transition, regardless of like however the technology came to us. But it really became like part of culture 1945. So like that, tr this like technology transition, we've all been born into it. It's just happening faster and faster. And like, where is it specifically going? And then the implications for like those of us who are like, well, I'm not going to participate in that like laid out path. Like there's like, that's like part of the transition. Like how is this going to show itself? Like that's, that's definitely happening with, without a doubt. Um, it'll be interesting to see if like a major earth event happens, like, you know, theoretically, if a comet is a trigger, um, you know, an electric universe and some of these others, uh, like, uh, um, alternative explanations of like what our environment is like, like, be like, yeah, well, comets are triggers because they do this and this and this, and like, maybe that's the case. I don't know. And maybe something will happen, you know, we'll see, but we're definitely like, we should, we should hold that that clarity and how we live our lives is like there are changes they're happening right now um in my opinion what a lot of this comet thing was was just like the next latest thing to keep people at like you know the next thing to keep them on the edge of their seat like it really got in starting to get intense let's say in 2020 with like the with like the pandemic and then like, like, like nuclear war or like, you know, social riots, like there's always something which is right there. And that's one of the reasons I think that this, this comet story and this eclipse was like so embraced, easily embraced is because people are just like waiting for change and change is happening. Um, it's like now, and we're, I'd like to bring this back to, to the surrealism, which, which you mentioned, um, so I didn't really, I couldn't know imagine. Much, but... So I want to add in real quick bef between okay. the 2017 eclipse and this one, so many things have developed in my personal life and in the world that I had literally no capacity to imagine in 2017. I, I witnessed the totality of that one as well. It, it crossed through Missouri both times, 2017 and 2024. One thing I've told this story on the show a bunch of times, but I, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but on the 2017 eclipse, I actually saw luminous beach ball sized white orbs uh, with a couple other people. It was before the eclipse happened. And I've heard other people talk about that kind of thing happening on eclipses. But at the time I had not ever heard of it. I wasn't expecting it. So we're sitting around our campsite sober and from behind my car, this white ball just rises up and starts kind of doing a dance above us about 15 feet over our head. I jump out of my chair and run over towards it to see like, where did this come from? What's projecting this? And then a couple more come out of the ground as if they're just phasing through the solid matter. And they shuffle around like one of those shell games, you know, where someone's trying to hide the, the marble under a shell and they would combine and become one and then split into multiple again and combine. And then they flew away and flew off behind the tree line. That all happened in about 60 seconds, but it was, it was really intense. It's like the most paranormal thing I've ever seen with my eyes. And there's a co-witnesses there with me, but on the surrealism thing, like I could not imagine the surrealism of 
AI generated art that was coming just in a few short years. Like that wasn't an idea in my head at all in 2017. So when I think about what could be different seven years from now, uh, it's, it's intense, man. Uh, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And imagine applying that same lesson forward seven years, like the, the future that's coming. Like if you, if you could go back to 2007, I think that's when like, like, like iPhone came out, like that time period and people are getting their first, like, you know, mass produced smartphone and you hand it to like who the version of yourself, you could try and travel back and you give this to yourself and, and you try to explain, like, I'm giving you this phone and it's going to change everything. It's going to change how you live your every like small detail in how you interact with reality. Like this is going to change the world. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. Yeah. The world's going to be changed, but you can't imagine it. Like you can't. And so like, that's the best we could do right now. We'd be like, and I would imagine like the, the amount of change is going to, is, is growing. And so like, we can't even imagine all we can imagine is like, yeah, it's going to be much, much more different and maybe a trajectory similar to the, the one we're on. Um, uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, it's wild. Well, another thing that I'm thinking about right now with the comet showing up is I wonder if there's some kind of like divinatory power bestowed by the comet arrival. Like if it, I, I say that because the scream thing, that painting is a, the story behind it is kind of like in star Wars where. Alderaan gets destroyed and Obi-Wan Kenobi feels it through the force. That's okay. That's the idea behind the painting an experience that the artist had, if I'm not mistaken. And he's just trying to capture that where he like felt something horrible was happening, but didn't know what it was yet. So that alongside with the etymology of comet, which comes from coma, which is hair in Greek, but you know, we have a different meaning for that word in English makes me, I think they, uh, the ancients even would consider the comet, the, like the hair of the goddess, that's what the tail of the comet was. They saw it as, you know, I, I don't want to go <laughs> talking out of my ass about exactly what they saw it as, but I do know that the, the hair has to do with things. And also in our modern sense, you know, we have the idea of being in a deep sleep and maybe divinatory dreams could be impacted by the arrival of the comet, or maybe it's something that's to jolt humanity out of ways in which they're sleepwalking and that's what all of the triggering of particular events that pop off in the world seemingly around comets might relate to what is what does that make you think of um so the more i study this place that we're living the more i realize like i don't know nothing i have no idea what what this place is and and i'm not trying i i don't think i can and i don't think it's like i don't think that's like uh like of purpose is like to figure it out there's lots of explanations but but i don't and what that means is for the most part like you accept that you accept that i can't figure it out and that's what it means like oh well it's it's a mystery i just accept the mystery what you can do is maybe begin to understand a little bit more about like how this realm works this place we're at and this this realm is so like self-fulfilling prophecy it's consciousness driven it's driven by beliefs and and our beliefs are invisible i mean that's one of the things we have to recognize like if you believe something you don't know you believe it like if you truly believe something you don't think that there's a thing that you're believing. You just assume it's, that's what it is. It's like, that's very different. Like, Oh, I believe it. And like, what, like what, if you say you believe in something, that's an intention. I intend to believe that the things that we believe, we don't know we're believing them because we're believing them. We, we don't think that it's, it's up to being questioned. So, and that's kind of like where a lot of this, like the consciousness with some degree of awareness, I suppose. And I'm, so I'm anyway. not saying that we're in a simulation or anything, but there is a, a metaphor to programming with that in that well-written code is invisible. You know, you don't see totally. the code and beliefs kind of operate that way. 
I I can understand why I like when someone's like, yeah, I really think this is a, a simulation and they'll go down like the reasons why they came to that conclusion. I'll be like, I mean, they're pretty good reasons. I can't like refute it. I don't necessarily subscribe to that, but that's because I'm trying not to subscribe to anything. But I recognize the same truth that you recognize. Like, like there's when you begin to see like how the system works. So where I'm going with this with with comets and even more so like like what we call space and what we call astrology and planets like like we 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 get this feedback loop and what what matters is where we're putting our attention and how we're defining it and that creates this like like weird like self-fulfilling prophecy realm like what you believe for some degree comes into fruition in a way that you hold that to be true and it's my opinion that there is nothing greater, like more potent for tying in or anchoring a meaning to than the heavens, because the heavens are the human are the unifier of humanity. And what I mean by that is like everyone on earth in theory has equal access to the sky. We get to all see it. And from that, we all and no one gets to like own it per se. Um so these stories, these like long held stories, and maybe they're accurate or what they definitely are is like they're hold to be true. And when we begin to like, just to, like, yeah, that's what this means. Like it becomes like almost like why an egregore or the logic behind an egregore works. Like when enough people believe in something like, yeah, it really comes true. Like that's part of the nature of this reality. That's why indoctrination is so important. That's why like, you know, the, the, it's the small things that, that like hold it together and then it becomes real experiences. So I don't know what a comet is, but I do know that comets do have those effects that, that, that you're describing. And, um, that's that's part of that's part of this game which we're we're experiencing that we're we're sharing together. Love it, man. There's a good comment here. Comment the exact midpoint of 2017 and 24 2024 eclipses is 12 14 20, which is the day they released the cow pokes, the cutie cooties cure. That's an interesting that's point. A, it's 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 perfect programming, perfect programming. <laughs> Doesn't um, surprise me. I, let me throw this in there. Like, this is one of the things that, like, when you think about this, like, it makes kind of what I'm saying make a little bit, like, it doesn't feel so abrasive, maybe, or, or like, you understand how the game works. So Chiron, <laughs> Chiron was discovered in 1977, right? That's when it was. It was discovered in 1977, same year the, of the personal computer when, when, when Apple... Tandy and, and Texas Instrument, I think, like first like released like personal computers, people, same year as the Star Wars franchise went into the collective consciousness. Chiron's discovered. It's discovered by an astronomer. The guy's name is like Knowles or something. And so the guy says, I'm going to name this, this, this asteroid, but now there it's classified as an asteroid comet, if we're going to be accurate, but, but we're still going to call it an asteroid. And it's located between Saturn and Uranus. He's like, I'm going to name it because he discovered it. Um, he gets to name it. And he names it Chiron. So, and then it was adapted and adopted by the astrological community. So prior to 1977, every like natal chart or astrological chart that was ever drawn up. And people were like real serious about astrology in the seventies and the sixties and even like fifties and forties. And like, you know, they've been, they've been serious about astrology for a real long friggin' time. So the addition of Chiron is like a big deal. And like it came in and like nowadays, if you look at like an astrological chart, a natal chart, like Chiron for most people, like that's going to be as significant as any of the other like planets in terms of interpretation. So Chiron wasn't discovered till 1977. It was named by an astronomer and he named it Chiron because the class of um, like heavenly bodies, which, which the, the object, whatever the hell it is, which we're calling Chiron, like they're called centaurs because they kind of like has something to do with their orbit and their relationship to Uranus and, um, and Saturn. So anyway, because they're called centaurs, he's like, I'm going to name this after the grandest of all the centaurs. I'm going to name it after Chiron. 
And so then Chiron came in and then Chiron was adopted by all of the astrologers in the astrology community. And Chiron's meaning is the same. The astrological meaning is like a pretty clear reflection of the mythological telling, the Greek mythology of, of um, the centaur Chiron. And so the point I'm trying to make is like, and, and I do a lot of astrology charts, you know, that's one of my primary ways of being able to like financially support myself. So I'm not like poking holes in astrology. I'm just saying this is the nature of how this realm works. I know that Chiron is a key, a key marker for understanding the individualized egoic experience. And I know that Chiron's meaning is tied to some astronomer who named it Chiron. And I also know this, if that guy would have decided to call it Hercules, well, then when we would do natal charts since 1977 in the comet or the asteroid we call Chiron, we start calling Hercules, it would no longer be our place of wounding and where we've got to like, you know, like learn and grow from our woundings. Be like, no, this is where I get my motherfucking strength. Dude, you're blowing my mind with that because I never really considered the introduction of Chiron in particular. You know, there's lots of those outer things that aren't so widely considered by charts but chiron is a big deal they put as people put as much weight on that as any of the the main luminaries and yeah. what you're describing is kind of similar to how as pluto is discovered in 1930 is the same time that the theory of the unconscious is circulating for the first time exact same yep. thing so, so like, so I, I guess if we were to look at it from another perspective and, and some of the astrological perspectives, a very holistic astrological perspective would be like, well, of course, this was a time for in the human evolution that Chiron is introduced and it was perfect that this astronomer found it and he named it Chiron because yeah, that guy just called it Chiron. It. He just decided to call it Chiron. It's like such a but weird... It's like chance is also in charge of this in some weird way, which trips me out <laughs> because that's my name. Right, exactly. But it, but that, that doesn't take away from, from like Pluto or Chiron. It like, it, it explains more. So like, this is the nature of the reality. And when you get caught up in like, well, like that debate, like, well, is it this or is it that? Well, then all of a sudden you stepped out of seeing the bigger picture and now you're in this kind of like dualistic, well, I think Christianity's right and I think Judaism's wrong. No, I think, you know, you're, you might as well be having that conversation. I think the Eagles are the best team Pennsylvania's ever had. No, it's the Steelers. Like, it's on that level. They're all the same. Like, once you realize, like, this is just how it works. And, and when we begin to become more aware of, of that, and, and you begin to see like maybe from a different perspective. So I want to pivot slightly and then I'll, I'll stop talking because I want to hear your response. Well, I'll, I want so to just say this, that it's like we didn't, we, we think that when we become adults, we, we, we forget how to play pretend. But what if becoming an adult is becoming so good at pretend that you forget that you're playing pretend even more than kids do? You know what I mean? I mean, that, that's that's one of the main metaphysical explanations of consciousness, right? Like, you know, the joy of forgetting, uh, the, the joy of remembering what you've purposely chosen to forget. Like when you begin to like, like, like I've gone like almost a hundred, like the, the, the very long way to describe like, yeah, you could read that in any Esther Hicks book, right? You know, like the, like your entry level, like, like a uh, uh, new age sort of thing. I'm like, so... So this is this is where where to me this this comet story got really interesting was Dolly. Like I know I know Salvador Dolly like as a cultural person or cultural touchstone. I know that he is the face of the surreal movement. I know like maybe a handful of other like uh painters I suppose who might fall into surreal but I don't really know anything else. Like I've never really put that much time into it until I started looking at this and surrealism is so much like going back to like this time, like let's say 1910 to like 1930 surrealism is much, much bigger than just like an artistic movement. It's a philosophy 
a philosophy that was very popular with artists, poets, political theorists, philosophers. And it was this idea of recognizing that there is a greater reality, um, which the reality which they were living in is housed in. And they're like, okay, there's something bigger. And this, and this greater reality is the source of dreams and the source of like the unconscious and the source of all the mysteries. And they said that they called that greater reality, super reality, like the bigger reality, the super reality. And then that became surreal. Like that's where the term comes from. So it's really this like philosophy of like really wanting to like, change the human experience. Now, a lot of manifestos were written. These are the same things the Rosicrucian manifestos say. We want to change the human experience. And their definition of changing the human experience was to be completely like open to and allowing the flow of this super reality to like dictate what day-to-day -day life looks like. And then a lot of the artists then express this idea in a lot of different ways of juxtaposing they were juxtaposing different ideas that shouldn't, that were illogically connected, but somehow made sense next to each other. And I'm reading this. I'm like, that's fucking synchro mysticism. That's the exact same thing we are today. We just got a different language. The term synchronicity was not like coined until the fifties. So whatever we're calling synchronicity, like they were, they understood it and they saw it and they framed it up in their minds in a very different way but we're talking the same, like the general concepts. So that being said, like, however this world works, and there always seems to be a they, like, I like the idea that they's also us. Like, I'll go with that, but I don't know if that's the case. I'm like the, they, the, 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 the surrealists from whatever that timeline is, which is seemingly so different from this timeline, they're like talking to us, through a language which only the modern surrealists could hear. Only the modern synchromistic, only the, like your audience, like me, you, all the people who like are seeing the world in this language. And like, it's, it's pointing to like, to me, I think it's really friggin' funny. And I think they had wicked senses of humor. So that's kind of what I got out of the whole eclipse. <laughs> I think that the synchro mysticism before it had a name has been going on from the beginning. I think that's where mythology came from. Honestly, I'll go with that. Cause I'll I've go with that. And as I've looked into trying to answer the question for myself, how did this story of the monomyth come about? Where does it come from? Why is there, you know, where, what's the origin of astrology? <laughs> Who were these people that were able to, create a site, a psychic internet by putting stories onto a connect the dot game in the sky. Like, what is that? You know, I, I've imagined things as, as far out as that human consciousness was different at a certain point and people were more connected to just the innate knowing of all that is and hadn't Makes maybe done a sense to me. And so then they looked at the sky because the sky is something that everybody can see the whole thing wherever they're at you know it, it does change you see 180 degrees maybe technically but you get what i mean it's like it's a collective experience of wholeness that maybe ancient people would be able to look up the sky and they would everything that there was to know was somewhere represented up there and they just had an awareness of that and maybe they gave the job of keeping track of it or telling the story interpreting it to fewer and fewer people and the ability atrophied. I don't know, just spit on here, but there is a more traceable part of the story of this star scripture going back to if it was the Babylonians or if it was ancient Etruscans in Italy, or if it was some other people that predates them, but they're just one of the earliest versions of it that we still have any kind of trace on. I don't know, but the scholar john McHugh, he's a guy i've had on a bunch of times and he wrote this book called celestial code of scripture and he shows very very interesting literal text elements of the constellations mostly focusing on like the babylonian akkadian languages and their 
crazy system of abbreviations in cuneiform where one abbreviation or logogram could mean a whole bunch of different things <laughs> because different groups were creating these ab abbreviations sort of separately and then later people were collecting them all into big lexicons and the game that the priests would play was that they believed they called it lumashi right the star star writing constellation writing and they had this belief that whenever they're looking up at the stars based on the names of certain stars names of asterisms constellations etc uh puns and wordplay or po uh poly polysemy which is like multiple meanings of a word that they could derive out of what was already established by their predecessors as the names of things that that constituted if they could find a pun or wordplay that had yet to be seen that that constituted divine revelation so they're they're literally deriving and McHugh shows this with bible uh miracle stories quran miracle stories uh some other cultures as well but it's like once you have this kind of lens you can start to see it really clearly how the like the name like the multiple meanings of one word that's the name of a particular star uh give you all the elements of a particular miracle story so that's like where the crazy seemingly unrelated ideas or like just illogical combination of events that a lot of myths hold potentially is deriving from which is a lot like this surrealism that you're talking about like the uh the star we call regulus that's in leo to the sumerians they would have a meaning like child and king and a bunch of other things that basically all add up and with other things in the stellar tableau around that region to give you born in a manger king of the jews a, ba a baby that's the king you know all of all of the parts of the puzzle and uh McHugh goes through it like with a fine tooth comb and is just going verse by verse in certain bible miracle stories and showing like you know right down to the syntax of how it's written of the every part of speech that's in the verse not just the big ideas he could pull out of this sumerian and akkadian uh lumashi star writing so it's it's fascinating how multi like how how that story continues to evolve as our version of what we are looking at to do the very same process. Um, you know, our attention moves from one place to another. You could, you could apply the whole idea to celebrities or to Hollywood and movies that that's a different kind of stars that you're reading as a divinatory method to see what, you know, check the pulse of the collective unconscious. It, it just goes on and on. It's like, a, I think it's just a fun game that we play. I don't have a, a, re, a why that it works that way. But once uh, once it began, it seems to have just kept, the train just keeps rolling and evolving. Uh, and I mean, to me, like that just points to, that begs a question, like a deeper question is like, well, okay, well, what's the nature of this reality? And why is that, why is that holding true? And whether the, and I don't know the answer to that question. Like this goes back to like the, the, it's all a mystery. And maybe the answer to that question is like, oh, it's because it's all simulation. And that's like, you know, how the code like propagates itself in like embedded in the history, which is told in the simulation. Or maybe it's like this is written by God or maybe this is written by the same or it's because the same priest class has been controlling the, the slave classes in the exact same way for as long. Or maybe it's like different time, you know, different parallel timelines. Uh, the one thing we know for certain is like, like it's undeniable, like it's the same it's the same story, the same idea anchored into the same largest canvas, which we all share, the sky. And it hasn't changed much. Like, uh, like the example you gave us would be the Babylonians and seemingly tied uh, uh, Leo characteristics to that same general part of the sky and those white dots that we're, we're looking at right now. So is there anything else like Susquehanna centric that has come into your awareness around these events or just in general research lately? Well, so, okay. So when you, 
this is this is a little bit of of you know just my 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 personal philosophy i suppose um when you become like very aware of this sort of uh self-reflective nature of our experience of our reality um that's that's a um, a fine line which one has to walk because you one could go crazy <laughs> and really what crazy just means is like no one else understands your reality but you because you're having such a distinct um a distinct conversation with the, the 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 universe whatever it is that 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 other which is being reflected back to you so the point I'm trying to make is like, yeah, this ties in real deep to the Susquehanna. And the reason why is because I have tied in like within my own mind, my own lens, so much from that, from that perspective. Um, There's kind of like a rock, paper, really scissors thing that goes on in life where you have your normies and you have your psychopathic, like wannabe ruler types. And then you have your synchromistic schizo types <laughs> and the... Yeah. I mean, the, uh, if you want to break it up into those three, certainly. It's kind of just I think a joke, probably but a little bit the overlap. The, there is, a, of course, overlap, but the the normies don't understand the schizo synchro people. The but the psychopaths understand the normies, right? So like, and then the the, the wheel turns, and the schizo psycho people understand or don't understand the uh, synchro mystic people. Right. But the synchromistic people understand them. It's like a rock, paper, scissors game. <laughs> and uh, I don't know who actually wins, but there's kind of like a funny, there's like three camps. There's the ones who aren't trying to control anybody, but, you know, see meaning in everything. There's the ones who would rather be controlled, but also don't really see much meaning in anything. And then there's the third group that their meaning for them is the attempt to control, you could say. I mean, you know, like, cause there's, I get there's, asked there's, this question all the time about astrology. Like, how do you, how do you use this to your advantage? Like, you know, you know, you know, all these things about astrology. What, what's the best way to go about improving your life using astrology? And my typical answer is like, I think the point is that it's, it's built into the system so that we can see that it's more than just like some mundane material reality, but that, you know, there's nothing you can do about it no matter what, you're going to actually live in some kind of reflection or alignment with what's going on with astrology, whether or not you try to like set up rituals to do that. You know what I mean? Like, what, what do you think about it? Do you, I mean, well, I, I get like doing intention to like think up with nature on purpose and that that can create a feeling of empowerment or maybe invite more synchronicities in, but also they seem to just happen anyway. It's nature life. Yeah. Um, so, to me, that question really is going to come down to how someone like the, and these are individuals, so there's not like a right answer, but like the more clear someone is with themselves, at least, at least they're being in, in, in integrity. Um, you can see that the culture, the paradigm, the way we live is um, it's inherently anti-human and anti-earth it just lives out of harmony with like what's our system is set up in such a way that it exploits the earth and it exploits other human beings it's a domination valued culture and so that's just the way it is that's the way it's always been like if we want to go down like that whole like priest class control sort of mindset whether or not that's there's history or not i do know that it's true for right now and so a person needs to then go and ask themselves, it's like, well, if I'm aware of this, and if I'm aware of this enough to know that there is a controlled opposition built into the paradigm, and you're like, okay, what do I do? And some people's answer is going to be like uh, the, do the dude Cypher in Matrix. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to go back into the Matrix. And I know this is a fake steak, but I want to eat it. And I know it's going to feel good in my brain. Or, you know, that whole sort of thing. Like, that's kind of the, 
particularly the psychopaths who understand the nature of reality. They're like, well, this is the world we live in. And I don't have any other world to live in. So yeah, I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to make my, I'm going to do the decisions which are best for me. You know, I'm going to be like, let's see, I could even be like kind and open hearted. Like I love my fellow, my fellow man and, and blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to go and I'm going to live my life in harmony with the values of the system. And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving this as a backdrop to answering your question. Like, what do you do with astrology in a practical way? So then the question becomes, and, and let's take a step back. The paradigm is built on astrology. It is built on astrology. It is fused in at the very foundational fabric in which our society is built is astrology. Just go walk into the, to the Congress building, go walk into the headquarters of the Federal Reserve, and you'll see zodiacs are everywhere. So, okay. So then the other idea is like, and, and this is where you start getting like you move from, uh, Dali, uh, from Salvador Dali to Dalai Lama, because I think they're the same guy or it's the same whatever. And you start to have like, like, okay, how do I meet this world? Because I can't fight the system, but I can become aware of it. And I understand like, what is the energy I'm going to hold in this system? And then we could even add one more uh, layer to this, like this particular moment in time where things are seemingly happening faster, that a major shift, maybe it's already behind, uh, we've already done it, or maybe we're moving towards it, time will tell. But you begin to say, like, how do I want to participate? And if I know I don't want to be part of that system, which I have been indoctrinated to develop beliefs and values that line up to supporting that system, like, well, what do I do? All right. So your question is, what do you do with astrology? Well, if you are trying to be in paradigm and you're like, I'm just going to do what's best for me, man. Like, and I'm not arguing that if that's what you do, that's what you do. Um, you use astrology and you do your rituals and like, you know, you line things up and you do manifestation shit. If you are like, whoa, I know I don't want to play that game, but I don't really know what other games to play. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. What you're doing is you are aligning your internal clocks, your internal movements outside of the false time, the 1260 matrix, which came from Babylon, 12 hours a day, 12 months, 12 signs, 60 minutes, 60 seconds. Everything is on that, on that, 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 that ratio. It conditions the brain to see reality from that perspective. When you begin to move outside of not to another system, not to, well, I'm going to go to the 13, you know, 20 ratio. Like, no, just go to the biggest thing you can become aware of the cycles, like make it meaningful because you know what you're doing, not meaningful because it's tied to a mythology, but because you're like, it's a mystery. And that's like the most real thing I have. And I know that it's always moving. And if I'm at least in touch and integrated internally in my rational mind and in my intuitive mind and in my heart and my like all of my my energy bodies with the biggest system that I can follow, you know, at least I, at least I could say I did that and I can surrender to that to move me. That takes yeah, balls, you don't, you don't live you in a model. You live in a mystery. You live in a mystery and it comes it comes from with a price. Well, I will, uh, I'll take this back. So. The first step is it comes with a price from culture, meaning like you got to fall out of culture and all of the sweet stuff from culture, you got to be willing to walk away from. But then if you're really true, you could do whatever the fuck you want and you get to move in and out of culture, but you're not touched by it the same way. Like this is like, like, um, and, and that's for each individual. This is like all of the teachings of all of the ancient, like, 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 ancestral teachings are basically saying the same sort of thing. Like, like, you know, you, you recognize what's real, what's not, you're still going to be alive. And like you live with no longer attachments to the values of whatever time and place you're living. Easier said than done. <laughs> and it's not like it's, it's not like you achieve it and then it's done. It's a tightrope. You're always, on an oscillation of getting a little sucked back into the culture, feeling a little more independent from it. Right. Unless you, I mean, that's the person I know people are like totally dropped out. I'm not there. Um, I've got too many like ties. I'm not willing to walk away from. There are too many skills I don't have, you know? 
So it's like, you know, I meet life, I meet life realistically. And, and, and that's part of like, this is, so it's an immensely compassionate energy to hold because you're talking to people and like, it's a continuum. Like, you know, you can't like, when you begin to like compare like your integrity to another person's integrity who are born into the same system. And remember the system may all just be a game. Like we chose to do this so we could forget how it works and remember, like that could totally be the whole thing. Who knows? But when you're, when you're like holding yourself judgment and you're like looking at someone else, it's like you're playing domination. Like to me, that's like the ultimate paradigm. It's a paradigm of domination. Like as soon as you decide like, like, you know, who's right or wrong, you're already playing domination games. Trees don't play domination games. Lions do. That I mean, that in and of itself kind of has to be applied to the idea of whether or not it's good or bad to be integrated to the culture or not. You know what I mean? Like that's also kind of a value judgment that <laughs> I, but you're, I just, I see like, this life as, saying, like, well, I see this life as a, like part of how this all works is that you, you get what you wish for. I don't, I mean, that's my subjective experience, but everything I ever wished for, if I really wished for it, and I did whatever I could towards it, things would happen so that that wish would come true. Even things that were far outside of my control. And I think maybe that's the, that's, that's one of the things that some people have just forgot and that's where they feel maybe beat down or they feel disempowered. But that seems to be the case for other people I know that have figured it out. And it's not like the secret, it's more subtle than that, but it's also kind of more simple. It's also simple, It's really simple. Well, uh, the very beginning, like what you wish for, it's, I mean, we're, we're kind of dancing the same along the same sort of texture with like, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy realm. To me, the, the question then becomes is like, what are you wishing for? Like the, and this is like a, this is a, like a big question. Like, what do you want? And when I say you, I'm just being like rhetorical you, because you need to ask yourself the way, the way the system the way the system continues is it creates desire. It's, it's a parasite. If you understand how a parasite works in the body, the parasite makes the host desire what the parasite wants. So, and you're like, so to me, that's like the, the next level. Once you realize like how the world, like the reality works, then you're like, and then you're, you kind of understand like the clarity of like how, how, like the quality and the texture of our, of our, our sick society. And you're like, okay, there's that. And then you're like, well, what are my wants? What are my wishes? And like a real question is like, is this a real wish? Have I been conditioned for this? Like, like, I mean, think about sugar, like sugar, like we, we, I think sugar is the most like physically, like physically addictive thing that's out there. We're all addicted to it. It was like made for us to be addicted. Like there's that desire to like want it, and then, and you can see that you're like, I know that the, the, for whatever reason, sugar is not something I want to put inside this system. Um, are you familiar with the, but you the never ending story? Like the book, I'm sorry. The never ending. Are you familiar with the never ending story? The book, not the, uh, not the movie. Uh, not, not in detail. No. So the movie stops at the point where, uh, Bastion, the main character, who's like reading a book in our reality gets sucked into the world that he's reading about in the story. Right. And that's, <laughs> that's a synchro mystic experience to like see your own life reflected in some fiction that you're engaging with. But in the book, that's actually kind of where it all begins for him because now he's in the world of Fantasia and because he's this outsider being that is of the same class as whoever like wrote the story, he's basically become an author of the story from within the story. And that means that he has the capacity to basically wish for anything and it comes true or happens in this fantasy world. But what the consequence is that he has to discover along the way is that the more that he makes wishes that are not aligned with his true self or his, his authentic original intention for entering the world, the more he forgets about who he was outside of the fantasy world. And I think that that, 
absolutely is what it, how it works here. It's like you're talking about, yeah. you know, you could wish for more sugar, but is that really who you want uh, or like what you actually authentically want? Or is that something right. else is implanted wish upon you? And a lot of those wishes that he makes that lead him away from and make him forget who he was outside of the fantasy world were, you know, for the purpose of somebody else in the story that is kind of trying to just get a hit off of his power and capacity to make things happen. So that's the, I always like to bring that up because that's such a powerful. And I think that it's, um, I think that that was like a theosophist guy that wrote the story or uh, maybe a, a Crowleyite or something like that, but definitely someone really deep into occultism. And I never, I can never forget that. Like, yeah, the, the more you wish for things that are not in alignment with who you are, the more you forget who you were. And I think that that's sort of one of the big things about this life game thing. You're talking about, you know, the, the basic spiritual precept of remember, like the fun and joy of remembering something that you intentionally forgot that like, what, what am I here for? Isn't that sort of the one that we're all dancing around? Like, why, why am I here? What is this? That's the thing we're trying to figure out. And that's uh, why I, I also consider it like if there's a creator to this place are aligning your true will with the will of the creation, which would be shown to us in the sky potentially, or you you know, it's a model for that, that that gets us closer to answering that question as well. Which is what makes I, it so powerful. I would say you don't. E- I would say you don't. E- you don't even need to answer that question. Like the question is like 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 th- this way the the whole like surrendering aspect. Like I mean, if you're being now granted, like I mean, I, I I keep saying this because I don't want this to sound like you know I'm preaching or I'm lecture or lecturing because it's 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 each person is the captain of their own ship. I'm just you know I'm 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 sharing things like show me the contradiction in what I'm saying. Um, like when you begin to like, we've been conditioned to want things. And I mean, the most basic is going to be money. Like that's the clearest thing. You'd be like, Oh, you know, I'm not going to wish for money. Um, but that, because it's easy to see that when you begin to like, look at (coughs) all of the things that you desire, like if any, it, if it's a thing, like right away, like there's, there are experiences and qualities which we wish to hold. And then that mystery, like when you don't define it, that's the big thing seemingly about this realm is the moment you define it is like when, when, when it, you get into trouble. Like that's when you get away from like what you describe maybe as like your, your, your true desire, your, your, your true, whatever is like this idea that I know what that is. And the truth of the matter is like, we, 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 <laughs> this is going to sound funny. You know, we, we can't really trust ourselves or at least trust our desires, but we can trust like what we want to experience per se and trust then in like the bigger movements. I like how you use the word creator, like that would, that would, be true for if this is a creator of a, a simulation or not. Um, like we're in movement on that level of reality and whether that's our soul level or what, whatever, like we can, we can take away that part where we define what it is because that seems to always be where the trouble pops up. Yeah. Uh, especially I mean, that's kind of like a mechanics of language thing. The, we, we lose the creative, uh, we lose the synchromysticism when we get stuck in definition and like single definitions. That's actually, that's why I brought up the Lumashi star scripture thing that the whole, the whole modus operandi of the priesthood at one point was in finding the puns and the plays on words, but Hey, we have, um, we have a surprise call in. What's up, Dylan? What are you handsome bussy schnitzels talking about? <laughs> hey, I was um I was just I saw someone in the chat talking about money and, and Michael just meant said money. And I was reading something. Did you know that mammon is a Syriac word that it's like an undefinable term for money? So that memnom of like unrighteousness or whatever it's like it's like getting money illegitimately and 
all this other stuff, but it like the Bible like encourages that. <laughs> and I was uh, on this like this Robert Taylor kit today because I've been um, uh, just for a little tease for those of you who are, who are subscribed to Chances premier channels or whatever, all that membership. We've got a very special guest coming up in a couple months and uh, we're going to flush out some really cool stuff. But I've been thinking about maybe doing a whole series on that one book that I sent you because I've been there's a lot to it. Yeah, man, it's on my to read list as well. But honestly, I asked you to call in because uh, I've, I've wanted to see you and, and Uncle Mike interact for a while because I know he follows your work, too. A certain extent, and so you know, you guys just you two play. I wanna, I wanna just observe. Yeah, how dare you? I literally just got back from a walk. I was literally had a nice cigar. I was at like this beautiful lake, mountains in the back. You guys could have had this whole background. Now you get my apartment. Unbelievable. So, so this is the first time that that uh, Dylan and I have 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 spoken. I guess close to face to face and. Um, there's very few things which I follow on online for a variety of reasons, not to say that there's not like valuable stuff out there, it's, but Dylan's, Dylan's Instagram work is some of the most enjoyable things I've followed you for, uh, for probably as long as you've been on in, in Instagram. And I want to tell you how much I've enjoyed what you've put out from all of the different angles, which you come from. Like I, I definitely feel, uh, inspired by your work so thank you very much for what you add to this uh equation which we're all participating in thank you i appreciate that that's wild yeah i uh the instagram has got it, it used to not be censored and so i used to it used to be worth my time to post a lot of stuff there it's not anymore but uh you know i don't know how long you guys are going but we can always do another one if i knew you guys were getting together i would have come on but we can we can the three of us can get together and we can do another one live stream or you can come on uh me and chance do a, like a private one now for our paid subscribers so if you have an audience i don't know if you have a paywall or whatever but what we do is we record it and then we put it behind the paywall so your people don't have to subscribe to us they can just get it exclusive it's it's nice so it's innerverse and spirit world put together so it's inner world I bet that's fantastic. What I would like to do is I do not have a copy yet of the real universal empire and I've been wanting to, I just haven't been able to get a copy. Let me read that book. And then I'd love to come on your show, come on and talk to you guys. Yeah. And we don't, you don't have to talk. We don't have to do, uh, uh, the, the real, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Like if there's stuff you want to, I want to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear myself all the time. <laughs> There's no like, uh, we're not like bribing you. Like there's no like, you know, people that have supported me and have been in the, and been in the, like my sphere of influence for a long time. I'm happy to, you know, give a platform and do, you know, we don't, I don't need to be the center of attention. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, that is a conversation I look forward to having. Uh, He's a Leo I, so son. This is what, I don't so know, he I, actually does need to be the center of attention. It's a Leo thing. <laughs> No, he is Trust whether me. he wants to be or I, not. I've followed his work. Like, like, like I have an idea in my mind, you know, for whatever he decides to share with us. And it's like, he's it's probably like been that's... around since the schizo posting days. <laughs> like that's the getting... thing, which is so much fun. The slick of, I was getting slick of a long time ago. <laughs> Like, and that's part of like this whole dance is like the arc we each take as individuals too. Like, you know, it's, like we, what you and I were talking about before chance were like really big picture sort of things, but then to like bring it back down to like the joy of being human and like that experience of like stepping into who we are. Like I, that's why I, I like Dylan's endearing to me because I followed that. Like I've seen like his work. I remember like first looking at his fiction work and like all of these different things. And it used to be a little bit more showing of like his personal stuff. So it's like, that's built into like, the 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 medium in which you know that to me is probably one of the f the few bright sides in which what 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 the 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 internet has brought to us thank you yeah well i'm i'm very grateful that people like you have been around for as long as you have and um you know a lot of times when i when i post stuff it just feels like it's going out to the to the void and people aren't really getting it like they're not even like receiving it um, just when I look at like my metrics, 
So uh, I appreciate that you did stick around. And uh, yeah, it's very, very grateful for that. And uh, All right. All right. I got a great cut. Can, can I tell you a great story right now? This just, I, yeah. I can't believe I haven't even thought to share this. So um, maybe about a month ago, I'm traveling up from Florida to Pennsylvania. And I stop and I stay the night at someone who I've just met through Susquehanna Alchemy, just through like this sort of stuff. Like he came to an event I was at and I've met so many people who are friends. Like it's, it's interesting. Like I don't, anyway, I've met like real human beings who I've had like real friendships. It doesn't feel like weird. Like the fact that I put out content anyway. So I meet this guy and he offers to put me up like as I was traveling through from Florida to Pennsylvania. He lives in Ash, uh, Asheville, North Carolina. I don't know if you know much about like the demographic of Asheville. And he and his wife, they started an independent school right after the whole sort of pandemic thing. They're, they were sending their children to like a Waldorf school. And then the way their Waldorf school responded with like masks and vaccine, they're like, this is crazy. And so they went and they've got, um, they've got a decent piece of property and um, like real, real interesting, thoughtful, well-rounded human beings are like, we're going to start our own friggin' school and we're going to start an independent school. And the school is called, um, I put myself on the spot. Let's see if I can remember the App Appalachian Academy of Therapeutic Arts. Like that sounds like a real fancy like school where you'd go learn a therapeutic art, but they teach like children from first to eighth grade. They're an accredited school. They went or an accredited independent school, all this sort of stuff. So this is the point I'm trying to make to you, Dylan. So I stopped by there like maybe about um, three weeks ago and he said, hey, would you, and I have my starboard. I have a, this thing which I invented, which kind of like, like crosses the bridge between astronomy and astrology and abstract and like, like what you can know. And it's this real cool sort of thing. And Dude, it's like, you should come on our show and do that. You should, you should like give a, you know, give a really nice I'd organized to show presentation. I'll yeah. So I'll, I'll definitely do that. So he asked me, he's like, hey, the, the students which I teach, like, I would love for you to come in and show them that. And let me go give you an idea. And he's like, these aren't like normal kids. Like, I mean, obviously they're normal kids, but this is what the curriculum looks like. And he says how he uses your books and they go through and they break down words based upon the way. Yes, yes. And he was saying this. I'm laughing so hard. I'm like, have you reached out to Dylan? Because I think like to see like the guy runs like a legit operation. Like, like I'm watching him. Like I've got a good, like, like I've got a high bar of like paradigm effectiveness. Like I'm like, yeah, that's really effective. You've like do, done it the right way. And the way you're meeting these children and what I'm seeing, they're learning. And they have taken your work and are applying it to like 11 year olds and it's blowing 11 year olds minds. That's freaking Lost awesome. Yet. And, and what I, I can't wait for you to read the real universal empire because I specifically really toned it down so that you could give it to children. It's like super not, it's like not uh, controversial at all. It's very basic. It's interesting. Um, but it's not like, you know, I was like the first two books and the, and the first third book at the time of the first third of the third book, they were intentionally alchemical. I wrote them intentionally to evoke certain things in you. I, I uh, wrote them intentionally to show how we're hypocrites. All of us. I'm the biggest hypocrite. You know what I mean? Like it was a way to like right. to, to kind of get under your skin in certain ways, but also to give you certain keys that will help you understand this stuff. But I, as I got, as you know, as you know, as you've seen, I've, I've left the feast of nonsense over the years. I've left that behind. And I just try to focus on what like demonstrable facts that way, nothing you use will make you look bad because a lot of this stuff, if you talk about it and you start going on all these side tangents, it's fun for us because we know it. But if you do that with like somebody who's never come across these subjects, they're going to be like, what the hell are you guys talking about? <laughs> you know, it's too much for the person who's not ready for it. But there was like this false, like there was this time where it felt like everybody was ready for it, which is why I did it. Cause I felt like there was like this wave, you know, like when you're like surfing or body surfing and you know, you're about to ride that wave. And it's like, I got to take this wave cause it's going to take me all the way into the shore. That's what I kind of felt was going on with like consciousness. But I think it, it wasn't like, I think it was like a false, I don't know. 
it just felt like we like something has happened circa 2000 like 19 and onwards where i felt, felt the wave dude no i felt a wave at first but like it, it something happened like something died like it didn't it didn't uh it was like we're trying where it's like you know what it is it's like have you ever heard of the fire the paradox of fire where it's like the heart the more you need a fire in the wilderness the harder it's going to be to make because it's probably snowing or raining or something and it's cold I feel like that's what we're dealing with. And every time we get like a spark, we're like, dude, we're going to light this motherfucker. And then it just like fizzles out because the conditions aren't really, <laughs> we're just not good enough at making the fire yet. And I feel like once we get the right conditions, we're going to make a, a bonfire and it's going to be a, no, a giant nobody party and everybody's going to come out to it. But until those conditions, we kind of got to just weather, we might have to just like wrap ourselves in animal skins and stay in the darkness, whatever. Can tough it out. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm gonna have my friend get in touch with you. Um, send you some pictures of what they do because I know that would. I think I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot there, particular uh, of potentiality. Like when I saw what he's doing, and now listening to what you're like, how you positioned, uh, and it took me so long to realize that the real the real universal empire spell true like it was a while before i made that correspondence but you're always that working at that there's level so many, there's so many un um, unintended synchronicities that i didn't i didn't plan out so there's that and then after i figured after i saw that I, I i chose that font to highlight it but then um crow i just did crow uh, a couple weeks ago that'll come out in like maybe like two months because he's got a he's got like a pipeline but um he noticed he's like did did he's like i appreciate that every chapter is in like he said like decans or something so it's like every 10 pages is a new chapter and so the chapter numbers actually correspond to the book numbers up to up to a certain degree and i didn't plan that one out either and then i published i didn't know when i was going to publish it because this is probably the last book i'm going to publish that's for a while that at least in the foreseeable future and um so i was like in no rush to publish it i just wanted to make sure it was good and um it felt right and then i published it and it just happened to be the birthday of someone dear to me that uh she died when we were young and part of the tale of Anora series in addition to it being wrapped up in some of my favorite stories that have never been made into movies part of it was in the, that context i used to have like really vivid dreams of us all grown up and going on these adventures and i would write the dreams down because i don't really remember my dreams i like it's just every once in a while I have this dream and it's like a whole movie experience from beginning to end. So I write it down and it happened to be on her birthday. And there's just like all this weird, like spiritual stuff because I made the, the point. I was like, I'm just going to, I was like, God, I'm going to give it up to you. The timing of this, everything's going to be in your hands. I'm not going to worry about the astrological weather or anything like that and just publish it when, you know, on your time. And that's how it all happened like that. It, it was a lot of, it's a lot of cool stuff that it's like, you can dismiss it as coincidence, but it it is weird. Like when it happens, and it's like, man, it doesn't feel like coincidence, you know. This is why I like to follow the guy, just for 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 this sort of stuff because you see that it's not purposeful, but you can watch it in all of his work. Like the 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 integrated the integration with like the 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 super reality or whatever we want to call it. It's like the unintended. Picture unintended purpose but you know i want to also just give credit because i typed it in the chat but one of the best things i've heard anybody say at least all month but maybe in the past couple months you said i try to approach life realistically and that's one of the things that's changed about me is i was so idealistic that when things didn't go my way it would like break my heart and so one of the things i've changed about myself over the past like three to five years is getting myself out of idealistic thinking because I realized, and it's not knocking feminine qualities, but it is a feminine quality to be idealistic. And that's great for them, but they need us as men to be realistic so that we can, um, so those energies balance us out. And when we're together, we can like, you know, walk, like maintain a consistent tra tra trajectory. And if we're all idealistic, you know, nobody's going to be paying attention when, you know, things need to be, realistic decisions need to be uh, made. 
you know? So that's one of the things I've tried to be working on on myself. Cause I used to, I used to just see ev- like, because I have those like weird pattern recognition skills, sometimes it's hard to ignore all those synchronicities, you know what I mean? And so that's what I've, I've kind of like pulled that back. And, you know, if it's not like blatantly obvious, I, I even though it doesn't seem like coincidence, I have to just kind of say, well, if you're not going to communicate directly, I can't, I'm just going to put it there. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the wink and the nod, but I'm not buying into anything. I'm not getting caught up in anything unless it's like clear cut. <laughs> Uh, all right, Chance. I got like a couple more minutes, but I want to. Sh- I want to. I want to tell a quick story. Can I? Can I do that? Yeah, you bet, man. All right. So this is kind of in um, in uh, in parallel to what what Dylan was just saying, and and um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I your work resonates with me is you hold that balance, you hold that balance of, uh, and would definitely hold an awareness to like moving towards that balance of, of both receptive and then, um, uh, expressive in terms of how we hold our energies as individuals. Um, and we all find, we all find like our, what that balance looks like in our own lives and our own unique temperaments. Um, and I'm at a point right now in my life where, I've surrendered more to the unfolding in life uh, in certain elements and then doubled down into like, you know, the things which, which you can control. So one of the ways in which I have um, put my hands in the unfolding of the universe, which is the reason why we, we was talking about earlier chance about becoming in alignment with like just natural cycles and movements, because if you're going to move naturally, like you have to like, yeah, you, you got to surrender to something. So one of the ways which I've done that is um, uh, really beginning in June of last year. Like I've just been 100% nomad, like no hope, like no like permanent address, like moving around. And it shows itself practically in a variety of different ways in the last uh, probably since, um, since October, just, purely like different house sitting gigs. Like I've, I've lived in like different places, like some really, really like beautiful places. And for, I guess now it's been about seven months and I don't know how much longer I'm going to continue to do this, but there's an element of um, like lottery or chance or like, maybe it's just the algorithm of the platforms that, that help put like the house sitter together with the person who needs a house sitter. But because of that, like I look at where where I stay as like a little bit like what Dylan was saying, like, you know, I didn't I'm not really planning this, but I'm noticing what's going on. So I'm at a house right now and and I want to be a little bit um, uh, 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 sensitive about like, you know, I'm dealing with real people right now. So I don't want to exactly say where exactly I am, but this is the second time I've stayed at this house and this the uh, uh because we went there once we we house sat for them and then they asked us if we would do it again this house is in the middle of nowhere pennsylvania and for whatever reason for whatever it's not reason near woodward uh, is it is it near woodward out in amish country? i don't know where woodward is where's okay. woodward woodward's like western pennsylvania i used to go there as a kid for skateboarding camp it was fucking awesome i got to <laughs> no, skate like tony hawk like you made like all the best skaters from like the nineties and two thousands. It was great. Uh, no, no, it's, it's not near there. But when I was here for whatever reason, a series of strange coincidences put me in touch with a guy who at least culturally is presented like in all of the books that talk about project Stargate as the project manager gentleman um his name is dale groff this i don't know what stargate i don't know probably you gotta you gotta learn like nsa cia stuff but like like kind of like mk ultra remote viewing stuff they make hollywood movies about stuff which you're like oh this is a red herring but it's still like a big story like when when people like really want to go and prove that the government does weird stuff they're like well look at project stargate george clooney made a movie out of it like and it's all about like it's like yuri geller and 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 remote viewing it took place it was run out of the nsa in like the 70s and 80s 
Um, for a variety of reasons, I'm very the interested in. It's called the men who scare the men who stare at goats. Correct. That is the fictional story of what I think is of another fictional story. But nonetheless, it's a story that is real in terms of like the disclosure of things that aren't supposed to be disclosed. Maybe I'm being cynical, but nonetheless, I'm very aware of it because I grew up very close to it. So this guy who's known as like the project manager behind the guy. This is the guy who I, I was just like double checking this and reading like one of Jim's Jim Mars's book. I think it was called like uh, engineered control. If you're familiar with that book, it was a mind control book from like the nineties. Anyway, this guy lives like one mile away, literally one mile away from where I'm standing, where I'm sitting. And it's the second time I'm called in here and like the house I'm coming in, like, it's like a, the guy's like a former retired Marine. Like the whole house is filled with like, you know, like, like what it's like to be like a career Marine guy, like in the system. And then like all of this stuff keeps on pulling me to this house. And I'm like, am I creating these dots? Or are they trying to pull me home? That I don't know. I don't know yet. So I have an undecided, I'm not, I'm not grounded in any conclusion, but I am seeing a couple nods and winks. So I'll have to let you know the next time we talk whether or not. Yeah. It, don't ignore it, but don't make a decision on it until it's clear cut. You know, that's what I would, you know, not, that's my unsolicited <laughs> opinion. <laughs> All right. Chance, any final words for me? Man, I just appreciate you coming to hang out with us. Uh, I do want to, I'll just comment on something Dylan was saying about being realistic. I love that idea and to just sort of put it into practical terms. You're saying the idealism would cause you to get your heart broke when things don't go your way. I think a lot of us can relate to that, especially when we have such good intentions for life and for the world, uh, yet that's <laughs> doesn't always work out the way we think. And so our belief that it has to be a certain way can cause us a lot of pain. And the simplest way to get realistic is if circumstances occur or maybe another person gets in your way that essentially blocks you from doing what your intention was or what you thought you were supposed to do or how you thought things should be, pause right there and look around literally or metaphorically to consider, well, what can I do with this? If, if I can't do that, what can I do with this? And there's going to be a silver lining there. There's going to be something else that you could do that you weren't thinking of that actually takes you towards a goal, maybe a different goal, or would just be playing good for a, a different reason. And you tell yourself, this is my path now, <laughs> you know, th thank you. I thank you for blocking me life or, or other person. Now I see what my path is. And uh, rather than looking at it, like, you know, ah, oh, it can't be that way. I I'm, I'm resisting. I'm resisting because it's, it's always like a, there's always some kind of guidance that's coming through the block that is going to be for the greater good, uh, whether it takes you longer or less time to find that is up to you. Yeah. You just highlighted two of my favorite quotes. I have not nah, have to say them. Experience is what you get when you were looking for something else. And then the second one is sometimes things feel like they're falling apart, but they're actually falling together. You just can't see it at the time. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Mike, it's been a blast, dude. I would love to see you come on our inner world show. So that uh, true, true book, the real universal empire, it's not a, not a long read, but it's an interesting one. I think we have a lot of fun mixing it up together or any other reason you ever want to just come hang out. You've got an open invite, buddy. I appreciate that. Uh, Dylan, it was good to meet you. Uh, Gabe, goodbye to you and Chance until the next time. I got All right. It, anything you want to leave right. people with in terms of promotions uh, or things that you got coming up or how they can support uh, you, connect with you? Uh, Plugs. It's a thing people do. <laughs> right. So, so, this summer, we're, I'm going to be traveling uh, throughout the Susquehanna, uh, North Carolina, parts of Virginia, and then out to New Mexico doing those river and star ceremonies, which I was telling you about. Um, in my opinion, you know, where I am at life, uh, 
what makes the most amount of sense in terms of the energy, which I want to contribute to the paradigm is something that makes no sense to paradigm value systems. That's how I know that like I'm walking in integrity because it is out of the values in which they, they force in order to, to live. And so by putting my energy into these river and star ceremonies, weaving the water of the Susquehanna river, the oldest river system uh, with other rivers is a way, which, you know, supposedly many cultures have done like throughout earth, tying that into natural astrology, astrology with uh, grounded in mystery, but without the necess the necessity to interpret or provide meaning, but just recognize that it is a connection. And this is a statement as like a way to be in this time. Like if you want to participate, if you want to support, you want to come out to them. Um, yeah, you can, uh, I could give you the links. I don't know. Uh, I'll send those to you chance and, um, people can support that, uh, through donations or get the details as to where we're going to be throughout. I think we've got 13 different ceremonies, um, scheduled. And also like I always do my normal starboard sessions. You've had one, you know what that looks like and feels like, and that's always a good way to, um, to support me. Yeah. The starboard sessions are great, man. And you showed up with the starboard session at, a a time in life where it's kind of like what I just was describing things didn't go the way I thought they were supposed to, or, or whatever. And I had to see how that was act, you know, since then I've seen how, Oh, well, there was a reason for that. That was my path. Right. It was actually falling together. Right. right? Uh, but I'll, whatever links you send me, I'll share it with our telegram audience. I'll recopy it into the description of uh, the YouTube video and all that. Fantastic. And great to see you, that, man. Jay. Great to Definitely. see you. Thank you for Thank you for the opportunity to come on and talk to you guys. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, you'll let me know if you're ever time. traveling through Missouri, right? Oh, we'll do. We'll do. Cool. All right. <laughs> see you, Mike. All right. See you. Appalachian Trail. You're uh, Appalachians. You're either from there or off. I'm going to wing a make it. <laughs> what? You like to see homos naked? I've just offended all the Appalachians. Come on, you guys know it's true. Uh well, we had fun. Uh the great Michael Wan. While I've got everyone's attention, I want to let everyone know that the last interverse episode with Sage Popham about alchemy and herbalism and all that. Uh, I, if you didn't see that yet, it's one of the better episodes I've ever done on those subjects. It's particularly amazing and mind blowing. It's all about the the pattern, the universal truth pattern, and ways in which you can train yourself to see it in everything and like know a thing without having a, a memorization or a category that told you to know it, but you know it because it's how nature works and you've proven that to yourself. So check that one out, Sage Popham, recent episode. You should uh, you should brand that a little bit more, the pattern and the potter. Because I, I, I got the feeling that there's some sneaky mofos that are going to steal that from you. Fucking Brent, you should, you should brand that a little bit more. I always thought it was like obvious. I thought that was like no, intentional. No, it's not obvious because you don't have a big enough audience. And you know, <laughs> there's some sneaky motherfuckers that like to, you know, they like to pillage. Yeah. Oh. The, the mater is the mother. It's the matter. And the father, the father patterns the mother. It's just the, the, the spirit patterns, the matter shapes it, the, all the esoteric doctrines held that there was not an, in the beginning moment and something came from nothing. It was always matter previously existing that just got reformed or repatterned into the next world. And it's an eternal succession of worlds. Yeah. You just say it so casually though, that somebody else is going to take that and get the glory for it. And I'm should sorry. I copyright it like a uh, trademark no, no, it like no, the no, science no. Just, Ira you Goodman? Just need to, you just need to make it incorporate it more into your shows and stuff and like kind of like that into like when you do shows about those said subjects, really, really delve into that, that that's why you're, you know, that's one of the benefits of this stuff is because that pattern is in everything. And um, the reason I'm saying that is because I hate these motherfuckers that say, Oh, it doesn't matter. It's, you can get anything done if you don't care who gets the credit. Fuck that, dude. That's like, that's like saying like, you know, 
It's incentivizing the path to poverty. No, if you make something like that and that's your thing, you need to be recognized for that and people need to celebrate you for contributing that, not pillage it. You know what I mean? That's all I'm saying. Well, and you're, this is coming from you, somebody that is really good at giving credit when you got an idea from somebody else. So it's not like you're just trying to hog all the credit, <laughs> but I see, I see your point there, man. You want to leave it, leave the people with anything before we wrap it up tonight. No, man, thanks, thanks for calling thanks, in. Thanks for having me on. I wish, uh, I wish I knew you guys were going live. I, I would have called in much sooner. It would have been fun, but, uh, Next time we'll do a show with Michael when he wants to. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Cool. I, it blew my mind that he knew somebody that's using your work to teach kids. There's This is like the second time we've talked and talked about in like the last month or two where you were like, yeah, somebody, somebody contacted me who also knew about your books. It's always weird. Like it's never, you never get used to it. Like for anybody who ever creates anything, you never get used to like people saying, Oh, I, I read this or I did that. Like I've gotten recognized and, in public and it's a little unsettling at first because you don't know if like the person likes you or doesn't they just recognize you so you gotta like it's it's weird but it's cool it's 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 always uh it's exciting to um the more i get away from the internet the more special it is when somebody recognizes something i've done cool well, so speaking of uh recognition everybody recognize the greatest substack on the platform greattide.substack.com get yourself on dylan substack thank you yeah and uh the way it's set up because right now i've noticed like just just the economy over the last year is really like tank. like i'm actually going back into the workforce because things aren't really going the way i wanted and which is great i'm excited to do it it'll be fun to mix it up but for those who are dealing with hard times, my Substack is spec uh, specifically structured so that if you get referrals, like if you share the articles or whatever with your social media and people sign up, even if it's for free, you get free months based on how you, so you could never actually pay for any of my work and just keep promoting it. What you're doing is you're helping my platform grow. So it's a win, win, win for everybody involved. So go check it out. And if you don't like it, it's not your thing. It's not a big deal either. It is what it is, but it's there. And it's designed to help people who are in, you know, regardless of your financial situation. And the whole point of your work is for the win-win. Also want to shout out Rachel Sparks for the super chat, 9.99 euros. Thank you. Always coming in with extra support. And I think you uh, subscribe in like more than one way to the premium stuff too. So thanks, Rachel. Hands down. Thank the you, Rachel. The best supporter we got well i don't want to say that but but i did <laughs> it's kind of true you're the most consistent appreciate that everybody else though we love you too and uh we'll see you on the next one got great stuff coming up on the calendar the show dylan teased i'm super excited for hope you guys have a great night out there and until next time